Well, good morning. Um, today's topic I'm going to share with you um, my 45 year plus marriage. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Let me get my thing out of here. Mm -hmm. um, I got married March 11th, 1976, two years after graduating from high school. I met Greg in high school. Um, when I met him, I didn't like him. It was in an art class, and uh, he ended up sitting next to me. In fact, I think, he, if I remember correctly, he switched his class to be in my class. Um, followed me everywhere. Uh, just, I just didn't like him. I don't know why. Maybe I should have listened to that instinct. But anyway, I didn't like him. Well, he was pursuing me, and... Uh, I was never one to turn down a free ride because I had to walk everywhere. And one day he had stopped at the bus stop while I was waiting for the bus to go to my job. And he offered me a ride. I think that's kind of what got me is, uh, you know, that car ride. But anyway, we dated for a couple years. Um, dating him was not a very pleasant experience. Initially it was, but then it, it, it wasn't. Uh, his problems started out while we were dating you know, he had, uh, he had, he had such, gosh, I don't know what the word is. He was excellent in gymnastics. In fact, some of his records to this day have still not been broken. He was excellent in, uh, several other things. He was well on his way to becoming a very successful man, but he got sidetracked by his choice of friends and, uh, drinking and drugs. Uh, some of some of us know the rest of that story. But anyway, that's what sidetracked him and ultimately ended up screwing him up for pretty much most of his life. So we ended up, of course, you know, same old story. I was here. I ended up pregnant. We got married. Um, I remember a few months, maybe not a few months, a few weeks after my wedding, I had found out that he had emptied out our bank account and our bank account had it was um opened by both of us with the money that we made or money that we made the money that we were gifted from our wedding and we decided to put that into a bank account until after the baby was born and then decide what we were going to do with it whether we were going to save for a house vacation I don't know but anyway it was a joint bank account and I had found out one day, I don't remember why I went to the bank. Banking was different in those days. You had to do a lot of stuff in person. And uh, I went to the bank and I had find out, I found out then that the bank account was drained. Not drained to where they closed it, but drained to where there was pretty much nothing left. So I confronted him and yes, he had drained the account without ever talking to me. And uh, given it to his brother with the, you know, promised that it would be paid back, but it was used to gamble. That's what started our, our whole marriage problems was the gambling between him, his brother and his father. And, um, I believe we did get the money back. I'm not sure. But that day when I found out, I remember coming home to our apartment and we had rented from one of my friends at the time and she lived in the downstairs and we lived in the upstairs. And I was five or six months pregnant and she had come out and she must have heard me coming in. And I don't remember, it was so far long ago, but anyway, she must have just asked me how I was or said hello or whatever. And then I proceeded to start bawling my head off and I kind of just kind of collapsed on the chair on the stairs and she asked me what the heck was wrong. And I just looked at her. She was the one who helped me the most with my wedding um, my mom didn't do anything, and uh, while she wasn't like my best friend, she was a woman that kind of took me under her arms, and so she helped me a lot with my wedding, and I just looked at her, and I said, I have made the biggest mistake of my life, and she said, what What are you talking about, and I said, marrying Greg, I should have never done this, and then she asked me what was wrong, and I told her about the money, and she kind of acted like, oh, you're you're making a bigger deal than it is, you know, money's going to get paid back. It doesn't mean you've made a big mistake. And I just looked at her and I said, I've made a big mistake. I feel it. I just feel it. I know it. I shouldn't have married him. 
that has stuck with me all these years. And, uh, I mean, this story is so long. I just don't want to go through it all. Uh, it would bore you. But the gist of our marriage was from that moment on, I mean, it, it actually goes back to when we were dating. When we were dating, he wasn't an honest uh, boyfriend. He was deceptive. He was taking money from me then. He would, back then you got your taxes in the mail in the form of a check. And I was a single, uh, yeah, well, yeah, I was single and I was uh, working full time and I rented my own apartment. So I was paying for my own bills in life and it was not easy. And uh, when I would get my tax refunds, that was like big time to me because, you know, that was a little extra money that I could use for fun or whatever. And I remember a couple times when I would go, you know, and there'd be no taxes, and there'd be no taxes, and there'd be no taxes. And then, you know, call the state, federal, whatever, come to find out, yes, your taxes were mailed, you should have had them, blah, 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 blah. I don't remember all the details. I just remember ultimately finding out that Greg had had been going to my mailbox and when the checks came in he forged my name and had taken the money and this is when we were dating so yeah he could have been in trouble for that and I didn't do anything I was young I was what 18 years old 19 years old and uh, I just remember crying about it and I don't remember if I ever got paid back I'm probably sure I did I don't know but that was the whole gist of it and there were so many signs during our dating that uh, I missed. I missed because of how I grew up with my parents. When you're a victim of extreme abuse and then you go into something that's not quite as abusive, better, you miss so much. And I miss so much. And, um, you know, he wasn't an honest man. He was a liar. He was a cheater. He was into drugs. All the good things in his life that he was doing, he stopped. He stopped all of it. And he went into the drugs and the gambling and drinking. And, um, you know, like I, one of the things that used to perturb me to, to no end was he had specific nights for me. And I used to remember him to a T. Uh, one was Saturday. And then I think another one was like Tuesday. He had two or three days where you know, he would see me. The rest of his days were his friends. So um, Saturday was always my night. Uh, I think Tuesday was, and there might've been one other day. It, it, it was just a weird, weird relationship. And um, he dropped out of college, dropped out of college three times. His parents paid for his college. He dropped out three times. Uh, I don't believe he ever did graduate. Everything good he did, he stopped. And he went into everything bad. Okay, so we get, I get pregnant, we get married. Our journey starts off like that, based on deceit and deception and stealing. That, those traits stayed with us our entire marriage. Uh, the lying, the stealing, the manipulating, taking out loans, forging my name, um, forging my name on, um, uh, what do you call those house when you buy a home, um, home equity loans. My name was forged on so many of those. Ultimately, every home that we had, we lost. I've lost every home I've ever had, three homes. Um, two we were able to sell before we were foreclosed on. One was foreclosed on. Bankruptcy three times, possibly four, because I really can't remember anymore because I just gave up trying to remember. Um, it's just been one financial mess after another. The drugs and um, that stuff ended in his thirties. When we moved, we left Racine. We figured if we left Racine, he got a job and we bought a house. Um, and we bought a house, not the normal way. We bought a house with the help of his father and his boss through a crook that financed this house. It was a nightmare. That was another nightmare. So, um, we moved away thinking that, you know, if I got away from my family and he got away from his family, we could get our marriage back on track and get things figured out. And uh, that didn't work. I mean, he did quit the drugs. He slowed down on the other stuff, slowed down on the drinking. The lying and stuff continued. The deception continued. The uh, loans with my forge name continued. Draining the bank accounts, any type of funds that we ever had, he drained them. There was nothing. And during all these years, I was raising five kids. 
I was pregnant after pregnant after pregnant. Um, any work I did was like house cleaning jobs, babysitting jobs. I sold Mary Kay cosmetics for a while. I worked at a kid's clothing store for a while to um, help buy my children clothes and things they needed, you know, that kids need, groceries. I learned at a pretty young age, probably my late 20s, early 30s, that because of my husband's way of life, that at the very least, I had to always make sure I had money for their school needs, to keep food on our table, and, um, you know, like birthdays and holidays. And so that's what I did. I always kept a stash um, so that it would never be like we didn't have money for food. We didn't have money. I didn't have money for things that the kids needed, like field trips or pictures. Um, they would never be without birthday presents or Christmas presents. I always made, made sure that I had that. I didn't work a quote-unquote full-time job with benefits, until my kids got older. So we struggled all them years. We only had one car. I never had a car. He always had the car. Any car we had, he drove those cars until they blew up. And I mean literally till the engines blew. I remember getting phone calls all the time how he was broke down on the interstate system. Someone had to come get him so he didn't know when he was going to be back. Um, all we had were junk cars. And um, the only car that we got was new. His dad bought. He ended up not making the payment on that. His dad ended up paying that for us. It just, that was my life with Greg. My life with Greg was one big financial mess the entire time, even after we moved. It calmed down a little, but it never, never was good. Okay, so we get older. I divorced him. Um, I believed I divorced him in my 40s. I went into income-based housing. I ended up, I believe for the first three, four months, all I did was sleep. And I am not kidding you. I just couldn't get out of bed. I think the toll of, you know, the hard years with him, my childhood, everything just got to me. I knew that I had to get a job. I knew that I had to get insurance. I knew that I had to work to be able to take care of my kids who are now into their teenage years. I didn't want to live the way we were living anymore. So I did end up, after three, four months, I was offered a job, which was a pretty darn good job, and I didn't have a college degree. And I took it. And the beauty of that job was I almost feel like God has always had his hand on me. Uh, like, I knew I had to work full time. But the fear of, of working, like, you know, where I had to leave the house at seven and I didn't get home till five or six and then have to cook for five kids, run them to sports or do whatever, you know, clean, cook, all the things a mom does with that many children, I, I really was scared of a 40-hour job. Well, I was offered a job that was a 40-hour job. But, um, you know, some of those hours I could work from home. Um, I could work on the phones. Um, I only had to go into my main office. I believe it was once a week. And so that wasn't so bad. It was about 45 minutes from my home. Otherwise, I worked in a separate county. I was put in charge of a county. I was working with, um, it was called Community Action, and I was working with the low-income people in our community, which is kind of funny because I'm one of them. But uh, I did that job until I couldn't. I did that for, oh gosh, I think I did that for three years. And so I met a lot of people, gained a lot of experience, gained an awful lot of confidence. I didn't make a lot of money but I had health insurance. Um, the money that I made because I was living in income-based housing allowed me to make sure that, you know, all my kids' needs were met if Greg couldn't meet them. And, you know, so I knew that whatever we needed, we would have. Um, and I'm talking main things in life. I'm not talking luxuries. I'm talking like, you know, food, clothing, things for school, that kind of stuff. So I did that job. That job ended. I ended up going back to Greg. Um, we went through counseling, did all that stuff, um, ended the counseling. I felt once again, like maybe we were getting this figured out. And I went back to him and went back to the house. And um, I don't remember totally how this all went down, but the house, the house then was at a payment that was affordable. Well, he went ahead and did some more crap. And he put the house into a place, I'm stepping ahead a little bit. Before this, we, um, no, we didn't. Okay, so we stayed divorced. He ended up um, 
getting the house into a place where it was not affordable. And, you know, he kept saying, well, I'll get another job. I'll take care of it. I don't want to lose our house, blah, blah, blah. I looked at him. I said, if you couldn't pay it at $600, you sure in the hell ain't going to pay it at $2,500 a month. We will be losing our home. And, uh, right time. So, anyway, it took a long time. Foreclosures take a while. It was a couple years, I believe. But... Uh, he stayed in the house with the kids. I ended up going back into income based housing. I ended up getting a different job, a very good job, another job that was considered full time. But I worked, I, a lot of my full timeness was on the phone. I worked with teens in crisis. And I was, you know, at that time I was in charge of my county and I had to go to another county once a week for meetings, but otherwise I was in my county. And so that meant that I was on call 24 hours a day. And anybody who works with troubled teens knows, you know, like I could be on the phone in the middle of the night. I could be on the phone at five in the morning. And I was. But the beauty of it was I didn't have to clock in somewhere, you know, at, at eight in the morning. And um, I didn't get home till six. I was very flexible. So I was available for most of my kids' needs and, and whatever. Um, I stayed there until the house the house was eventually foreclosed on. That was a very painful time for me and my kids. We loved that house. And uh, I knew that there was no way. There was just no way. I mean, it went from a $600 payment to $2,500. And there was no way I was going to work my fingers to the bone to do that. And like I said, if he couldn't pay $600, he sure in the hell wasn't going to pay $25. So the house got foreclosed. And I believe that was another bankruptcy. And uh, after that step, what happened was he wanted to move in with me. And I said, absolutely not. You know, if you want to get back together, it's on you. You go find another place to live. You know, it's got to be something that fits at that point. I think we had a couple kids. We had three kids left with us. The two older boys were out. So, um, and he did. He went and found a, a brand new house. Told the landlord our story. Um, the landlord appreciated his honesty and I have to say at that point Greg did did share his his um his problems with the landlord the landlord trusted him gave him the keys to a brand new house told us to make it our own and you know just pay your rent and you know whatever you want to do with the house you're welcome to do it and so we moved in I did move back in with him a year or so later we remarried and on we went um, I ended up uh, staying with that job until there was a new, uh, a new, um, I don't know what they're called, district manager, or whatever, took over that company that I worked for and um, fired everybody, fired, just got rid of everybody that had been at the job for some of them were well over 30 years. And I was the last to go. Uh, everybody thought I'd be the first to go because I was the only worker for my county, but I ended up being the very last person. So it took a long time for me to get let go, but then I was. Um, then I ended up uh, working for a dentist for a while. That was a nightmare, but again, it was, you know, it was money and I was able to help. Um, my main goal always was when I worked was to make sure that my kids had what they needed. I had that frame of mind that never again was I going to be dependent upon Greg for food on our table or clothing for my kids, things they needed. So I worked for a dentist for a while. Uh, that ended up ending, and then I ended up getting my job with the county. Now, that was a part-time job. We were allowed to work 19 and a half hours a week and no insurance, but I figured it was a step in the door. So I did that. I absolutely loved it. It was the greatest, funnest job. It was flexible. Uh, it, it just was great. Well, changes came with that too. You get new managers, bosses, whatever, and the changes always come. It ended up being changed to a 40 hour a week job with full benefits. The plus of it was, is those 40 hours, we could work up to 20 of those out of our homes, on our phones, whatever, and um, it included like taking clients grocery shopping, taking them furniture shopping, taking them to therapy appointments, um, going into their homes and teaching them parenting skills. It was really a, a really fun and unique job and it paid very well. And on top of that, I got paid mileage. So I finally was at a place where I was making really good money. I had insurance for my entire family, Greg, all my kids that were still under age. It was great. And um our marriage was still struggling here and there. 
Um, I didn't trust him, but with both of us working, things seemed to calm down financially. He was paying the rent. Um, you know, I was moseying on my way. I got my first car at the age of, I believe it was 50, 51. I'm talking my first new car on my own. I had a car before that, but my daughter had helped me get it. I made the payments, but she helped. So I didn't get my very own first car till I was like 51. And it was great. It was a great feeling. I financed it on my own. And uh, so then I leased cars and it, it was cool. It was nice having my own car and because uh, that was one thing I also never had with Greg. I never had a car. Any car we had was always a beater car. If it wasn't a beater, he made it a beater. So it was cool to have my very own car, knowing if I needed to go somewhere or I needed to get to my job or I wanted to go somewhere, I was going. So all that, you know, we kind of just were chugging along and things were okay. I still didn't really trust him. I always felt like I always felt like I cared about him. But I wasn't madly in love with him anymore. It was always so important to me to keep my family intact. I don't know where this came from. I don't know if it comes from God. I don't know if it came from the fact that my parents had such an explosive marriage. I don't know. But I, I know that that was so strong inside me that I wanted my marriage intact. I didn't want kids by other men. I didn't want other people in my children's lives. Um, I wanted to make things work. I wanted to be successful at the marriage. I wanted him to get better. I wanted me to get better. Because, um, I, you know, it, it does take two. Because if I was not screwed up or messed up, I would What normal, healthy person would choose to live the way I lived. It was horrific. It, you know, constantly worrying, like I've had my power shut off multiple times. I've had my phone disconnected. I've had uh, things repoed. I've had people come to my door to take my bed. I've had people come to my door to take my furniture. I, I went and worked for my uncle for a while uh, at his pizza restaurant at night when he would come home from so-called work and I would go work at my uncle's pizza restaurant so I could make $25 a month payments to keep my bedroom set. Um, I did that after having my second son, who was a, a pretty unhealthy baby. And Greg's dad saw what I was going through and ended up paying that off so that I could stop working. Uh, it, it was just terrible. I mean, it, it was a terrible, terrible life. I, we never had health insurance from Greg. Never. Uh, we paid off all of our babies. If they were paid off, you know, they were probably included in the bankruptcy. His dad paid off one. Back then to have a baby, it was like $525, $550. It was crazy, crazy life. I can't, it's so bad. I mean, the gambling, the gambling, he lost so much money gambling that we, our cars were taken away. Our lives were threatened. I actually left one time. I packed my babies and left for Florida and hid. Uh, you know, he was doing stuff with the mafia. It was just a horrific, horrible life. You would have to know. I mean, there has to be something severely wrong with you that you would stay in such an unhealthy, crap situation. And I did. And when I left, I went back. And each time I went back to him, it got a little bit better. But we have never, ever recovered from the damage. You can't. How do you rebuild trust when it was shot down for 40 years? Um, how do you rebuild? Like, you know, if he tells me, oh, it's sunny outside, the sky's blue today. I will literally go look. I don't believe a word he says. Um I don't feel that overwhelming, like, I love him anymore. I literally used to, I mean, this is funny, but it's not funny. I used to look out at the end of the day, you know, looking for his car to pull up in the driveway. And when his car would pull up, I would literally say to God, why? Why didn't you take him today? I don't want him. I don't want him alive. I don't want him near me and my kids. Why is he still alive? And it would have been far better if he had died. I mean, at that point, he had life insurance he was just like an anchor around my family's neck. And it was it was awful. And that's how I looked at it. And I, and I hate to admit it, but that's how I looked at it. So, you know, you know the rest of my story. Our marriage was never great. It was okay. 
And um, I'm going to end this at a, at a different point because we go into another segment of this. But this was the first um, 35 years of my marriage. We had finally gotten to a point of a little bit of stability with both of us working. The bills were being paid. We were doing things. I had a new car. My kids had what they needed. I was able to help my kids. I was able to do things. Like I remember, you know, I had pajamas. And I would go shopping for pajamas and underwear and bras. And it was such a big deal. And I am not exaggerating because I never had that stuff when I was younger married. You just couldn't afford it. So, you know, it was so cool to, to get pajamas and new underwear and bra when I needed them, when I wanted them. So when my kids needed stuff, then I started having grandchildren. I could help my grandchildren. I could spoil my grandchildren. It was great. So life was kind of um, flowing and things were okay. I still didn't trust him. I still didn't feel madly in love with him. I feel like we were just kind of, we were at an okay point. I was um, still working for the county, making good money. Things had changed at my job, which made it much, much, much more stressful. It was not good. In fact, it was pretty bad. But I had to stay because I carried the insurance and I didn't want to lose the income because I know for me what that means. So anyway, I'm going to end this here at the age of 53. When things are going well, um, and I did do this in my uh, beginning of my cancer story, I was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, given six to 12 months to live. This brings about the last 10, actually the last 12 years of my marriage, which I will go into next time. So um, if anyone has any questions, this was a lot, and, and there's so much more, I just... It's so much that sometimes when I'm saying it, it's like, I don't believe that I'm, that this happened to me. And I don't believe that this has been my life because I, I, I sit here and I think there's no way, there's no way anybody would live like that. There's no way anybody would put up with it. And I did. And, uh, I, all I can do is say, I think it's because I wanted so much to keep my family and my marriage intact, right or wrong. I did it. And here I am today. So my next, um, video will be on this last 10 to 12 years. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't. Please share it if you think um, any of my um, videos will help anyone. Please subscribe, please comment, and have a great day. Okay, so this video is going to be on the last, I guess it's 12 years now, I wanna say 10, but I'm going into year 12 with this cancer. So at the age of 53, I was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Um, landed in the hospital for a while. I don't want to go through all this again, but I did end up going back to work. Um, when you think, at least for me, when I thought that my life was over and I thought that I was dying, this job that I hated and all the things that I disliked that were going to be taken away from me, I decided to fight for them. And so I went back to work with the attitude that, no, I'm not dying. I'm getting my life back. So I went back to work and I only worked uh, less than, I think, 10 hours a week, 12 hours a week. Well, come to find out that uh, that was screwing up my disability benefits. So I ended up having to exit about two to three months in and I did. And um, then I ended up on disability and some other stuff and my health insurance no longer covered Greg. And so I ended up you know, in my, in my own little realm of breast cancer, I had benefits. I had an income coming in, um, but then I was very, very ill. And so Greg became my caretaker and he, you know, he wasn't able to work the way that he was able to work before, you know, he would leave the house sometimes, gosh, by six, six thirty, and he wouldn't get back till later in the day. So that all changed for him too. And I have to respect that. And I have to understand that that he was no longer free to do the work that he was doing. Of course, he was self-employed because God forbid he ever get a job, a job with benefits or anything. So he was self-employed. And at that point in our marriage, I stopped fighting with him on it because I was carrying the insurance and I was making good money too. So we were okay. And that man was not going to give this up and get a regular job. So anyway, I don't remember how long after, but he had a heart attack and uh, it was a bad heart attack. And, um, it was God's gift to him that he didn't die. So he had his heart attack. He comes home. So here you got a wife that's not able to do much, 
a man that's not able to do pretty much anything. And he was trying to take care of me in between when he was resting. And it never really occurred to me that he wasn't working. He would go to work, but we found out later when he was going to work that he was really going into parking lots and sleeping. And again, I can't fault him for that. I mean, he had a bad heart attack. So he would pretend like he was going to work and he would go in parking lots and sleep. So, you know, without me thinking, probably because I was in my own little, you know, cancer world and fighting for my life and going through what I was going through physically and mentally, all the changes going on in my life, it just, I never thought about it. But yeah, he wasn't working. And so, you know, he wasn't bringing in the much as much money and he wasn't, surely wasn't uh, growing his business anymore. And after a time, it was, uh, gosh, I think we might have held on four or five years uh, financially. And then everything took a crap again. And I found out that um, my son was paying all our bills. My son and his wife was paying our bills. And a lot of bills weren't being paid. Um, I also found out that he was... Uh, I had entrusted him with my bank account, which is a big no-no because you don't do that with someone like him. But I, when I thought I was dying and I wasn't in my right mind, I did give him access to my stuff. And uh, come to find out that he had manipulated my account. He was using my money to pay what he could pay. He had maxed out my credit cards. He had... Um, again, once again, taken any stash that I had around the house, he had taken all of that. Um, I was pretty much left penniless once again. And this time it was a worse time because of me being sick and not being able to go out there and work and make things better. And uh, this time was probably the hardest for me. But it was also the time where it was like, for some reason my eyes opened up big and wide. And uh, this is another segment of the story that I don't feel like getting into right now. But um, thankfully, I did have one little stash that he did not find. And I don't remember where that was or how much it was. But I remember I gave it to my son who was living with this at the time. And I said, you need to get this, you know, to a safe place, you know, your sister's house or something, because this is absolutely all that I have left. And if dad gets that, we're screwed. We won't have money for food or gas or anything. So that happened again. And it was one of those times where I just knew, like I knew that we were going to have to leave that house because my son couldn't continue paying for it. I didn't want him to continue paying for it. So I knew I was going to lose another house, even though we didn't own it. You know, we were in it for um, 11, 12 years. I felt like we owned it. We put our heart and soul into that that home. Um, I knew that moving was going to be in my near future and it devastated me. It was like, it just all came crashing. I didn't think about him at the time that he had a heart attack and that he did to him. He feels like he did the best he could do. I don't know what I think to this day, but anyway, that all came to a head five years ago. It was financially devastating. I knew that another bankruptcy was also in our in our future because there was no money. He drained me. Um, he had very little coming in. He was not healthy. I was a mess. So I knew all these changes were coming at me, even though he once again said, we'll be fine, we'll be fine. No, we weren't going to be fine. My bank account was a mess. My credit cards were a mess. Bankruptcy was looming. Uh, moving was looming. And Greg was one who always tried to make everything better than what it was. And I used to believe that. But then, you know, when you live with a man like that for so long, you learn that when they say everything is fine, it's not fine and it's not going to be fine. And it's probably going to be worse than what you think. And uh, so what ended up at that point is, gosh, I really don't feel like getting into this, but I guess I'll give the crux of it. I snapped um, when I found out that the money was gone, except that I remembered I had this little stash and I gave it to my son and I said, please take care of this, get it out of the house, get it to your sister, whatever. Then I, I snapped and um, I don't remember how this all went down, who I talked to, who I said what to. 
But I just remember sitting in the living room and I said, it had to be to my son that was living with us, that I needed to go to the hospital because if I didn't, I was going to kill his father and myself. And, you know, of course, he kind of laughed and said, well, mom, you're, you're, you know, you're uh, over exaggerating, whatever. And I just looked at him and said, I'm not, I'm really serious. Um, I need to go to the hospital, you know, and then I told him, I said, and this is how I'll do it. And for some reason, <laughs> he must have believed me and um, don't remember much after that. I don't remember if he took me to the hospital. I don't remember if, must have taken me because I don't remember an ambulance. But anyway, that's when I had my breakdown. And um, I get to the hospital, and uh, the police department is called in because I threatened, you know, a person's life and my own life. And I just remember the police officer, she was a female officer, and she came in and talked to me, and then, uh, you know, asked me what was going on, and I told her, and then she asked me, uh -huh what I was going to do. And I told her I was going to do, and she asked me how I was going to do it. And I told her how I was going to do it. And then I looked her in the eyes and I said, I can't go back into that house. And I told her, I said, I'm not kidding you. I will kill him. I will kill him. And so of course, then they got to do whatever they do. I don't remember if she read me rights or whatever, but I just remember she, she did it in a sympathetic, empathetic way, not a mean way or a power way. I could tell that she really felt like bad for me and she just looked at me and she said well you know you have a choice and your choice is that you're going to go into the psych ward or mental hospital whatever they call it you're going to go willingly or you're going to go unwillingly and she said you don't want to go unwillingly because we have to handcuff you and she goes, and I don't think you deserve that. And so I just looked at her and I said, I'm going willingly. I said, I want to go. And so uh, ended up, they called an ambulance. Took forever to get there. But, you know, I'll finish the rest of that story later. I was ambulanced a little over an hour away. But I remember that officer talking with me and just spending time with me. And she had such empathy and she's like how have you lived like this for this long and now you're sick and um she was really just a kind kind person and then um the last thing she did for me is she handed me her card and she said when you get out if you need someone to talk to or you want to go have lunch or whatever please give me a call and she said she really meant it. And I kept her card and I put it in my purse. And I'm going to end this at this point. I got uh, ambulance to the hospital. And I did look her up after I got out. I never found the card. And it was really, that was sad for me because I did want to call her and meet with her. I wanted to thank her for being kind to me when I needed it. You know, even though to the world I might have looked like a monster, I wanted to um, thank her for being kind to me. But then I also wanted to show her, you know, that I, I um, at that point, I can't say I overcame it. But I wanted to show her that I was okay and I was going to be able to face what was coming and, um, you know, that I would, I would be okay. I knew at that point, you know, after I got home, I knew I would be okay. But um, I'm going to end that there. And then um, that was the beginning of the last. Because we haven't had any since. And God, I hope I never do again. But um, that was our last financial catastrophe. And it was the biggest. I don't think it was the biggest financially. I think it was the biggest because of all the emotions, because of me being sick, him being sick, you know, 
and just the changes that it brought at that time in our life, being older, both of us being not healthy, um, him pulling in our adult children and their finances and their credit. So it had really been the worst for me. And I think what I'll do is I'll end this here. And then the next video, if uh, I guess I will talk about, you know, what happened that week that I was in the hospital and um, how it helped me be strong for what I had to endure because what came was was so harsh. And um, how it was when I got out, how it was after I got back home, how it was um, when we had to move, how we moved, where we moved, ultimately to where I am today in my in my marriage in my finances in my in my life and um so uh hopefully this all makes sense to you it's so much i know it's just so much but anyway um thankfully uh i am okay today and i hope that this may help someone that's in a really bad ugly place know that you're not alone i've been in really bad, ugly places far too many times. But um, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them. Please subscribe. Please share if you know somebody that this might help. And um, I will see you next time. Have a great day.